Welcome to the No Name Brand Podcast. My name is Sashka Hanarapal, actress, singer, dancer, turned brand marketing sales and advertising strategist who brands your soul. And each week I bring you an inspiring person or message to help you discover your undergod. Turn up your leadership notches, challenge the status quo, because you're fast and furious with a powerful message to share with the world. Thank you for taking time out with me today. And without further ado, let's get our creative and wisdom juices for low wall. Hello, wonderful, wonderful listeners. How are you all today? As you may hear, my nose is a little blocked as I'm recovering from a physical, spiritual, and emotional workout deep down in my soul. But I'm here as the show must go on. And I love a good show, just like you, right? And for today, I have someone that's going to give you a kick up the bum, especially if you felt a little meh lately in your business. Our next guest is all the way from Australia. Good day, mate. He's been knocked down more times than he'd like heck than anyone would like. But he's gotten up every single time with passion for what he does because he really loves what he does. He's like the dude from the animation superheroes, Mr. Incredible, that knows that when you're born to stand out, that the last thing you should be doing is blending in. And this is my next guest's special talent, spotting your uniqueness as well as your flaws and aligning them so that your business and life have only one purpose, to have the life you want when you want. So please, Get your pens and paper out, because this is going to be a session of golden nuggets. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Rick Chisholm. Hello, Rick. Hi, thank you. That was the best introduction I've ever seen, ever. Thank you so much for that. No worry. I do my research, and you know, it's very important. Don't want to do the usual spiel because we don't like that uh, on the No Name Brand podcast. <laughs> love it. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking time with us here today. The time difference and everything like that. So Rick was just telling me that whilst it's 10 o'clock here in the morning in lovely Austria, in Australia, the sun's going down 8 o'clock at night. It is, mate. It's almost just about dark. <laughs> it's just about dark. <laughs> All the surfers are coming in. <laughs> In fact, I just saw two koala bears having a fight over on the other side of the park. <laughs> Only in Australia. Only in Australia. <laughs> well, it could also have been kangaroos. You never know, hey? <laughs> so I'm going to dive right in because Rick has a wealth of knowledge that I'm looking forward to sharing with all the listeners today. So here it goes. First off, so that others can get to know you as well, I'd love for you to share, and I'm going to give you a challenge, in about no more than three sentences, maybe five, Share with us what it is you do. That'll be tough. Okay, I'll break it down into two lots. One, me, I guess the number one thing that I end up finding myself, people I work with are mostly cash flow challenged, time poor. And so my job is to try and turn businesses around, get their life back on average about 15, 20 hours a week, and hopefully double their profits within 12 months. That's the ultimate objective in the first instance. If you look at Innovest, my business, that does all sorts of things. And we try to bring them into, if it's appropriate, to share our resources from warehousing to our co-work space, even into our incubator. We have an accelerator as well. So a lot of things that we do, but I guess that's the two main things is time and cash that we try to improve dramatically with the entrepreneurs we work with. I was just reading something today and it really blew me away is that in 20 years, 40% of the careers that we know today are going to disappear. And the most yes. wanted state is freedom. So time and cash flow and money's not going to be so much of an importance. Obviously, that's the crux of every business's success, you know, to know that you're making money, that it's profitable, that it's not just a hobby. But what we most want, why we most want to do our entrepreneur journey is to gain time. Whichever reason, some people want the simple things in life. Other people want to, like it is with yourself, that you're wanting to live the life that you want when you want and not according to someone else's time. So that's really important for a business. So speaking about time and cash flow, 
where are you concentrating on or where are people mostly coming in in small business as small business entrepreneurs? Where are they failing forward with time and cash? Okay. The first thing is that a lot of people in business confuse profits with cash mm. and profit is not cash. Yes. And they confuse cash with cash flow. Mm. So you can be profitable. Your accountant can be telling you how wonderful you were doing last year, but it, can you pay the bills as and when they fall due today? That's I mean, if you look at the average definition of what defines a good business, when I do a lot of these talks and I ask that question, we workshop this, and it comes down to two primary things. And usually it's being able to do what you want when you want and making the amount of money that you're making without the business depend, or you want to make, that'll make you happy, without the business depending upon you. Yeah. Because if you look at the alternative to that, the definition may be such that you've got a job, which in Australia we say stands for just over broke, right? So here's the thing, right? In Australia, 66% of every business that goes broke is actually profitable. Wow, yeah. Right? And 137,000 businesses start up every day worldwide and 120,000 go broke every day worldwide, which is 88%. But in Australia, that number is significantly higher. And it's up to 99% of startups in Australia that don't get off, that don't make it to a couple of years down the track. Holy shit. So the numbers are incredible in Australia with, in terms of business failure. And here's the thing. This is where it really gets hairy. There was a report that came out in the number one newspaper in Australia on the 5th of November, like the month before last, that said that 60% of all young people now want to be a business owner. They want to be an entrepreneur. And already, up until the 31st of March last year, bankruptcies are up by 11% compared to the year before. And so here's the thing. All these young people are going into business, many of them ending up with mental health issues. They're working 100-hour weeks, sleeping on the floor like I did in the 80s, which was really stupid of me, probably going broke in 1990 when we had the recession we had to have was the best thing that ever happened to me. But they're not having a life. So... Most of these entrepreneurs are, are never getting out of what we call the trough of sorrow. Have you heard of the trough of sorrow? No. Toss. Oh, the trough of sorrow. <laughs> it's a term that was coined by Paul Graham. He was one of the co-founders of Y Combinator, which I think is a very successful accelerator. Mm -hmm. And basically, it refers to the period of struggle that startups have after they've had a setback. So they go right up. Where's my hand? They go right up. It's a, like a graph on happiness. Mm -hmm. So they go right up and then things go straight down and there's the happiness level where you want to be, but they stay under that. And get this right, and in 2015, there was a medical report that came out of a uni in California. 49% of all startup entrepreneurs self-reported mental health issues and that's self-reported. And in Australia... And it hasn't, we haven't done the same research, but we know it's at least 30%, which has doubled the average. So time, money, the stress of the expectation of being able to survive and succeed in business, they're all related. And the number one thing that doesn't get talked about in the media, especially in the startup fraternity, when you've got Zuckerberg and Musk and all these guys that are making it so wonderful, this entrepreneurial journey, is the point that you make about all these positions won't be around in a few years from now, that's already started. Mm. It's is going up. And I think the biggest problem we're going to have in the future within the next decade is unemployment. I know not so much the stats in Australia, but I know that with most startups or entrepreneurs, or even if you're running your business, I mean, I was listening to Damon John from Shark Tank, and he was saying how he took out a loan on his house, $125,000, and was only worth like $75,000. And what he didn't have was the ownership, someone with knowledge about running a business. Now, there's the yeah. product business, there's the product side, and there's the service side of being an entrepreneur. Service is almost, in inverted commas, easier to run as opposed to a product base because product base you're buying supply, demand, and then there's 120 day where you're paying. So you're not learning how to manage your money and the cash flow 
And like you say, with the prophet, so the accountant's telling, I remember as well in the beginning, it's like, oh my God, this is so great. I'm making money, but you can't pay the bills. So it's like, ah, oh, great. That's wonderful. So for most entrepreneurs, what I feel where they're lacking is that most, like an Elon Musk or a Zuckerberg, they have the power of survival in their pockets. They know that when they have that trough of sorrow, they know how to get out of it. Where through instinct or whatever, and whether it's, it's not something that we're taught, and it is something that we can be taught, like creativity. So when we're stuck somewhere, you can be taught there's not only one solution to a problem. There are many solutions and how to think out of that box. How are you teaching or are you teaching how to think out of the box so that you aren't stuck in that trough of sorrow and working with your mindset, changing frameworks in order to break through and go, I can survive this. Just because I'm down here doesn't mean it's a bad thing. That's a really good thing because it's taken me uh, more than 30 years to, to sort this out. <laughs> and so what I've launched at the largest startup exhibition in Australia to 4,000 startups in the first week of December last year was a thing called the Business Ownership Practitioner Certification Course. It's the first of its kind in the world. And my guarantee to people that go through this is that they will learn more in three days than three years of business school. We actually launched it and we launched it on the second, well, I went there to pr primarily promote this. And we launched it the week after StartCon and we had about 20 people go through. We had a couple of PhDs, we had two MBA graduates, we had a couple of other masters and a whole heap of SMEs and a couple of startups and a couple sitting on the line thinking about going into business. We had people telling us, and there's all these video testimonials now floating around, that they indeed learned more about how to run their business, people in business, than not only their three-year business degree, but their MBA. So my argument is that you should learn enough about business, a baseline level of knowledge, even for those that we will put through our accelerator, even for those that are thinking about going into business, and even for those that are SMEs and are in business, they need to have this baseline level of knowledge in order to not end up in the trough of sorrow, or if something goes wrong, have an idea of how to get out of it. So for an example, there's a colleague that I worked with was meant to work with. His business went from $250,000 in the first year in the bedroom, literally, the daughter's bedroom. And within four years, he was turning over $16 million with 100 staff. He'd never heard, or never, number one, never dealt with a lawyer. He had a master's, by the way, still does. Number two, he'd never dealt with the regulatory government department called the Department of Fair Trading in Australia. You'd have the equivalent, I imagine, over there. Yeah. yeah. Never heard of a thing called the ACCC, which is the national body, anti-consumer conduct and so forth. And to cut a long story short, he ran into some difficulty and didn't know how to tackle those issues. How can you have a master's degree in business, go into business, run a multi-million dollar empire, hiring and firing and marketing, doing all these things and have an expectation of knowing financial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera, and then... One little thing goes wrong, the tiniest thing, which escalates into a nightmare, that business is now gone. It's been fined millions of dollars by the government, all because of the wording of one sentence. And it became a beat up in the media. So my view now, and we own this name and we own this course, and it you know, covers basically everything from productivity, time management, HR, recruiting and so forth, offline marketing, guerrilla marketing, online marketing, everything we do this in three days. And then if they're really serious, there's one month follow-up study. If you compare that, right, that's about equal to what, one three-hour session for six months. People come out of uni, they're really well qualified, they're very clever at what they do. They run into business and they find out that they're not so flash at nine out of 10 other things that they should have an idea about at the very least. So to me, if you look at the numbers, only 5% of entrepreneurs take up, I find it's hard to believe, but this is what I've read, take up post-startup training, of which only 3% implement what they learn anyway. 3%? Right? So the, the numbers are staggering. So you take sales training, right? Let's take typical sales. So training by itself doesn't work. Training without accountability and having someone there pushing you to make sure that you stick to your goals. 
Training simply doesn't work. If you think about, so like I'm an engineer, that was my first degree, right? When I came out of engineering, if you were to ask me, what did I learn in the second or third or fourth year? Number one, it's already out of date. Number two, I wouldn't have a clue. And the day after the last exam, I pulled the curtain down. I've forgotten just about everything. But you know, I'm an engineer. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that I'm qualified to go into business and people will balk at spending the smallest amount of time learning how to run a business, but then they go into business and by that time it's too late. And that's one of the reasons why the numbers of failure is so high. 80% in Australia of businesses fail within the first five years, all businesses. And out of those that remain, 80% of the remainder fail in the next five years. That leaves four by the 10th year on average. Out of those four, only one is thriving. The other three are surviving and would have been working less hours, probably about half, and making probably about twice as much if they were working for somebody else. Yeah. It's horrible. The most qualified job in the world is without qualification, and that's becoming a parent. Yeah. That, there's, there's nothing. No business owner qualification. It doesn't exist. No. And I'm all for education because it teaches you a lot of the theory. But I remember when I was choosing my education to do marketing and advertising, it was so important for me to not just learn theory, but also put it into practice. Because without action, you can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. So although my studies were shorter compared to uni, it was more intense. And those that were doing MBAs were actually doing extra courses where I was studying as well, because they needed the practical. How do you put this theory into practice? Something that you mentioned before was about the online world as well. I love the online world, mainly because it's not so judgmental. The online world tends to, because it's easier to hide behind the facade. So nobody really sees you. You can hide behind a picture and you're not really networking physically and in person. What, in your opinion, good or bad booby traps in the on and offline world? You want to know something? (laughs) Number one industry category of people that come to us looking for help, digital marketing agencies. <laughs> because followed, <they're> by, <laughs> followed by lawyers and accountants. Oh, wow. They're the top three industry categories that come to us seeking help on how to grow their business. Wow. Now, this course I was talking about, in Australia, I don't know, would be over there, but in Australia, it's $1,000 or $1,000. When you do a course out here, You get saddled with this huge debt, right? So they have to pay that debt off for the next whatever number of years, which kicks in when you make a certain amount of money. But in terms of people online helping you to turn your business around, well, they might be okay at lead generating, but here's the thing. And it's funny because I just had this conversation with a digital marketing agency and she wanted me to come in and talk to her clients in a workshop environment to help them convert the leads into customers because there are no strategies to find new customers. There's only strategies to find leads. And then there's the sales process to convert those leads into customers. So she wanted me to, because her customers were complaining, she's not getting, they're getting leads, but they're not qualified. And so she figured, well, it must be the customer's inability to convert the lead into a customer, let alone the impact experience or the post sales experience or anything else. So I think many people that are online offering these services and going to help you get rich overnight, I think most of those get rich schemes. A, I'm not talking about Bitcoin, I'm talking about all the people out there that are a supposed expert is going to help you turn your business around. With it. I think most of it is rubbish. And most of those people don't have the necessary business experience to help their clients, even if they are lead genning, to turn them into long-term loyal customers. Mm. So I don't have a great, I don't have a high regard for a lot of those type of businesses. It seems like every second person we meet as a Facebook or a LinkedIn or an online digital marketing expert in Twitter or Pinterest or Snapchat or something. And most of those people that we meet don't seem to be very uh, well off or that successful in their own business. This brings up a very, in my mind, it's going ding, 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 ding. They have an idea, which is great, which is so important because I believe that out of there's 1% of the whole population that think like you. So that 1% as an entrepreneur, that's a shitload of people that you can market to. First of all, you have to market to them, whether it's lead generation, it's still sales. So it's learning how to get in that whole sales built with the marketing, all those things that go along with business, keeping it profitable, 
keeping the cash flow coming in, the advertising, building your brand, the branding, all of that is all over them. A very big part that plays with it and which I'm an advocate for is that life and business on separate entities. It's one. So whatever's happening in the one is happening in the other. And what most entrepreneurs do is that they try to keep life and business separate and they're not seeing that there's an alignment between the two. And what keeps the, the bridge between the two is your mindset. I'm just using loosely the word mindset, whatever that is. So whether you're going on, oh, look at the sun coming in. I've got this holy thing happening here. <laughs> so for those of you that can't see me on video, I've got the sun shining on me. So I look like an angel. <laughs> oh, no, look at me. So this mindset, this bridge that is going across to each other, what is your take on it? Do you actually teach this also in the Business Accelerator, the program, when you're going through this? Because this is such a big thing. When you're going to the trough of sorrow, the last thing in inverted commas that you're actually thinking about is the business, but more about the failure. And that failure is actually what accelerates you up, but that's a mindset thing. So working on that mindset to go, that's the thing that pushes me up. That's the thing that's going to get me forward and not hold me back. Well, you know, one of the things that you need to master to be successful is mastering failure. Mm. On my Facebook page yesterday, I posted a really interesting oratory of, from Will Smith. And he yes. was talking about out failure. Have you seen that before? I have. He I says, listen. if you think about this from the point of view of what we call the RAS, the reticular activation system, we all have this thing in our head that allows us to focus a particular outcome. And what a lot of entrepreneurs do, they take that to the extreme. And I did this myself. I sometimes was working till five o'clock in the morning. I was working nothing under a hundred hour weeks. And of course, that in fact affected my entire life and my relationship, sleeping, eating, I ended up with pneumonia, all sorts of things, and still never took a day off. And one of the first things I ask, especially what we call sole traders, is what happens if you get sick? And usually they don't have a contingency plan for that. So mindset is everything in ultimately becoming successful. And when you say you join, the two things that are joined like your life outside of work, and your life inside of work, there's an alignment. I absolutely agree with that. And a lot of people can't shut off. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I did to help me overcome that problem was I took up martial arts. I started pretty late and I've been doing it for the last uh, almost 30 years. And religiously, I make myself shut off, if you will, the mind, the head, the body, physically, emotionally, everything. Every week for the last 30 years, I've been doing that two or three times a week. And as a result, I now have a couple of black belts and I'm an instructor. So by becoming an instructor, I have no choice. I have to show up, mm. right? You've got to be there. But if you take RAS idea and you look at someone like Roger Bannister from 1954, for 2,000 years, they said the, the four-minute mile could never be broken. And then he broke it. And then all of a sudden, everyone else started to break it. And even school kids now in 11, year 11 and 12 can break the four-minute mile, mm. mile, rather. How did that come about? It came about because someone proved that by having a particular mindset, you could achieve these objectives and these goals. So it's all well and good to set a goal, but to set a goal and to use your mindset effectively, three things have to be in place. Number one, it must be, everything must be measurable, everything. Number two, it must be time-based. So we start thinking about Parkinson's law and Pareto's principle, we set limits and times. So for example, if you're doing martial arts, You've got to be there at that time. You've got to turn up. If you don't turn up, you don't progress, you go back. And the third thing is it must be achievable and ideally it must be ambitious. Mm -hmm. So the principle behind martial arts is very simple, to, similar, if you will, to the principle of being successful in business. So what martial arts did for me, it helped me, if you will, A, it improved my mindset in terms of discipline. And this is the problem with the gym. Like people that go to the gym, only 8% of people continue going to the gym after I think it's three months. So if you look at gymnasiums, the majority of people don't continue because there's nobody there pushing them and there's no goal escalation and achievement. So businesses like that, being an entrepreneur, I think you should look for something to help keep your mindset, not only on the job, but force you to keep yourself very healthy and fit and to allow you to concentrate on what it is that you're trying to achieve in your business. I think a lot of people don't know what, A, what business they're in, and B, what they really want to achieve. 
yeah, they just have this idea and it's just kind of like, I want to sell mugs. It's like, yeah, but there's, <laughs> where, to whom, how, when, how long you want to do it, how big is the vision? Is that where you're going to stop? Is that, you know, are you going to go bigger than that? Something that I was mentioning between the life and the business, and when you go into the trough of sorrow, when you're in your business failure, in inverted commas, but there's also the things when you go into the life, I don't want to say failure, but a life trough of sorrow. So in 2013, I was reading that your father collapsed with a brain bleed. So you took time to care for your parents. And just when things are getting better, a year later, cancer kicks in. And it's just like when you're down, you get kicked down even more. And although it's you, it's also your parents, whatever. So you took the time to care for them while still running your business as well. So you're still in this trough of sorrow. And it's got nothing to do with per se your business, but because both are linked. So I've watched a lot of people close to me as well, who've either immersed themselves in such situations in their business, or they've completely veered away from the business and just gone on a lost path, not knowing who they are, what they're doing, where they're going. Whereas with you, you did neither. Like you kept the balance. I'm not a fond of the word balance, but you kept both areas in front of you and steering both of them. Or did you use martial arts here as well to come out of the trough of sorrow, to put the two both in perspective and to steer both so you're not, so one is less than the other one to keep the businesses going and yourself going and that strength? How do you focus in such a surreal moment? In 2015, I have a few different companies which are under management, if you will. If I say one of them primarily was paying me not to come to work. So in 2015, I did very little work at all because I was looking after, I did virtually no work except take some phone calls and just looked after mum and dad. It was a pretty rough year. It was horrible. And so most of the year, I didn't work at all. In fact, the trouble, as you said, started in 2013. And just when I got my dad back on, because he used to work for me for 26 years, from 1986, I think, till up until 2013, when he had the brain bleed. He was picking up my kids from high school, from school, from primary school. Right up until that point when he was 90, he was still driving and he was still doing deliveries for our company. So it was a big turnaround. But in that year, if it wasn't for the success of our other businesses, I would have gone broke because it was those businesses under management that were operating on autopilot that was able to finance not only me, but also finance all the expenses that I incurred which were extraordinary in addition to just paying me not to come to work. And that happened just after, immediately after I launched a new company called Macquarie Business Consulting. And I'm, I don't think I sent it to you, but this is the new, that's mm-hmm. the new of the book. So anyone that's listening to this on your side, I'm happy to send them a copy of this book. It's just, you know, it's 170 pages. It's an ebook. It's not an ebook, but I'll, that's how I'll do it because it might be able to send it any other way. But I just launched this business in the beginning of 2015 and I had to cancel events that I had with 100 people booked to come and see me talk and speak about. was then a brand called Kick Ass and how to 10x your bottom line in your business. When I came back to work in 2016, if you will, after mom and dad passed, it was like every second person I bumped into all of a sudden was a coach. The name kick ass was everywhere. It was being used for everything. <laughs> so I had, to com- I had to completely reinvent the name, the brand, and then I, and Macquarie, the name Macquarie, it was also popping up everywhere for some reason. So then we changed the name and we changed the, the vision and we changed a lot about what we do and how we do it to Innovest SME. But yeah, I mean, how you come back from that, I mean, I think one of the good things about work is it keeps you busy, helps keep your mind off things. I've got to say, though, after Dad passed at the end of 15, it was really tough to come back because when I came back, obviously the finances weren't quite as good as what they were before this happened. I had to reinvent the business again, relaunch. And to answer your question now about martial arts in relationship to this point, the one thing that I kept constant was my karate. Through all of that whole period, that was the thing that kept me going. And I never, except for when I took my father long distance for special treatment, I never missed a class. And when I did take him, you know, the uh, specialized treatment, 
even there, I was swimming and doing karate every day, and that was helping me. The problem with swimming, of course, is that you're going up and down, up and down, up and down. The chatter, the noise is in the air. That's the difference between, say, swimming mm. and karate, martial arts. The one thing that I do which helps the mind more than anything, dirt bikes. I ride, I do motocross, which is a little dangerous. That was my first career in the 70s. And it wasn't a very smart career choice, I've got to tell you. But that's what Dad and me did for 10 years every weekend. And so when you're on a dirt bike and you're right out there in the middle of nowhere, you can't afford to make a mistake. So the brain focuses on mm. missing the rock and clearing the jump. So there are certain things that people do, like go to the gym, that doesn't have that impact, mm. like martial arts, where it helps you maintain that clarity and helps keep you going. Mm. That makes sense? Yeah, makes total sense. Well, a lot of entrepreneurs are so immersed in the whole trying to get the business work, trying to get the business work, the idea, and trying to push and push and push and push that you forget about the life side as well. So when you get a knock on the life side, kind of like when you have a wake-up call, but what you stay true to is that you love what you do. No matter how many times you got knocked down, you were true to what you're wanting to do with your life and who you want to serve as well and making a difference in that area. So I always say... It doesn't matter what career choice you choose, as long as you know what your life purpose is, which is independent of your talents and gifts or your career, you need to know what it, who it is that you want to actually be serving. And once you know that, it doesn't matter what happens, you can start any business, go in any direction. You'll always have, in inverted commas, success because you're serving someone and you're doing it with passion. So I understand that fully. For me, it's dancing. I do dancing. So I, that's when I switch off. When I do yoga, it's like swimming. There's too much chatter happening in my brain and I can't switch off. I'm like, oh God, when is this going to end? I'll tell you a funny story about dancing. My daughter, who's 10, was about to do her junior black belt after six years of training. Oh. And the week before she was meant to do her grading, I gave her a night off to go to a school <laughs> dance. She went to the dance in uh, the beginning of December and she broke her foot. She never got an injury. For six years of karate, she goes to a school dance and breaks a foot. Now she can't do it until next year. Oh, God, no. Oh, no. I did. Sorry, you go first. No, I was just going to say, I did uh, martial arts as well when I was younger. But I did so many different things. I was doing acting, singing, dancing, school sports, javelin, sprints. And then there was the karate as well and hockey and netball. And it was just like, you know, something's got to give. But I loved martial arts. In fact, I was actually thinking of going back again now. <laughs> Do it. Do the martial arts. I wanted you to. You know how many out of every 100, only one out of every 100 people that start actually get their black belt. I was the one percent. That's right. It's mm -hmm. if you really want it. If you really want something, and even if I'm not a person that believes in, uh, not believe, of setting goals, because yeah. once you reach that goal, it's like, well, what do I do next? And then you kind of let down. It's like, yeah. oh, that. Mm. So I'm just like, just stay in your lane and go. Like, if you know what that vision, just go and do it. And irrespective of what happens. Yes. So maybe I'm one of those 1%. Do you, know what, do you know what your chances are of getting a black belt if you do martial arts? If you want it, or if you're keen to keep on doing it, it's 50%. Because there's only one rule that matters. You've just got to show up. And if you show up, you've got a 50-50 chance of getting it. Because everyone can get it if they just show up. And it's the same as in business. Mm. Number, rule, one, number one rule is you've got to show up. That's so true. That's so true. For anything, you know. And, got my mind and, thinking, tick, 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 tick. Sorry? You got my mind thinking, tick, 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 tick. <laughs> <laughs> you and your business went through a really rough patch when the global financial crisis hit. You were turning over, like I was reading this and I'm going, what the hell? You were turning over per year $20 million or US dollars, American dollar, and the market, you were the market leaders in your niche. And... When something like that hits you, for some it might not hit as hard, or, but you will get some kind of knock in your business. How do you come out of that, like you having this money coming in and the business is running and then it's just like poof, and you're like, and now? And four years later, I mean, you mentioned it in the beginning of the interview where you were like, when the financial crisis hit, for most it would be like, oh, where do you go from here? But it was the best thing that happened to you because four years later, you were even stronger than you were before. So how did you cope emotionally and physically during this time? And when you get knocked, what are you recommending to your students, 
to your clients when something like this happens? Because it will happen. So I've actually been through three recessions. Sure. So the GFC Global, the one that I mentioned before, that was 1989-90. And that was a local recession, and it was called the recession that we had to have. And our turnover, that was my first million-dollar business, which went, went, went from 20000 in the first year to over a million in the fifth. <laughs> and turnover dropped by just under 70% in six months. So the thing that I recommend to people is that you've always got to have a niche, but ideally you'll have more than one niche. You'll have a second niche at the very least. So back then, our core niche was to do with providing entertainment. And the thing that, you know, I had to, and as you grow, as you scale, you tend to add on other things, add on other income streams. You open up more shops, you put on more staff. And sadly, when these things happen like that, Like then I had to close the shops. I had to let the staff go. I had to go back home. But the niche part of my business, I kept on with that. And what I did was I looked at the 80s and I said, well, that was pretty stupid what I did back then. I focused on revenue. I didn't focus on cash in the bank. I didn't focus on cash flow. And so I was financing this exponential growth that just went up and up and up and up and up. But when you look at the bottom line, for the first two or three years, I was minus. And then after that, I was lucky to be retaining one or two cents in the dollar. When I restructured within six months, by putting into place the lessons that I learned in the 80s and by studying what I did wrong, I then was able to keep 30 cents in the dollar. And so I was making $200,000 on the bottom, turning over half as much as I was turning over when it was a million dollar enterprise. And then I was able to sell that business at a really high profit. And during that period, when I had all that profit on the bottom, I started two new businesses. And those two new businesses still run today. And they became the $20 million business that you're talking about. Wow. That from 1991 onwards, 92 onwards. And those businesses became the market leader and took over the market in Australia, primarily when I kicked off this first franchise in the world around professional lighting and audio. Then what happened, we had our brand all around Australia. The government, in its infinite wisdom, decided to change the tax policy and rewarding people to buy overseas by giving them a 10% discount because they weren't charged tax like the rest of us. And all these other things went on and on and on and on. And then ultimately, things like CE, and then the government had a policy in place where, for example, lawyers weren't allowed to advertise. And then on the back of buses, you would see all these billboards, know your rights. And so all of a sudden, after 18 years, I never had one unfair dismissal claim, not one workers' compensation claim. And within the first week I had three workers compensation claims when this was allowed to be advertised this stuff and I had that year about five unfair dismissal claims so from a litigious perspective everything just went boom (laughs) and this just went crazy right up until the GFC in 2008 and that business like you said earlier it's a little bit easier with services business that was a business that was highly dependent upon holding millions of dollars worth of stock Mm. and so buying stock to people in Australia there's an expectation of what we call 30-day terms Mm. you pay for the goods three months earlier by the time you get your money back after you supply the goods it can be six months different and the average number of days now to get paid for an invoice is 57 days in Australia and that number is rising so you've got these metrics which are rising on that side And on the other side, you've got things like bankruptcies and so forth going through the roof. So we're heading towards a perfect storm in so many different ways. Climbing back out of the GFC and going back to the advice that I give to students, for example, number one, niche. Number two, understand, you know, the knowledge that you need to know how to run a business successfully. So, for example, financial intelligence, understand net variable cash flow, marginal cash flow, understand how to 
hire and fire, like hire slowly, fire quickly, how to put people on and make sure that you're not putting a square peg into a round hole. Yeah. I mean, we had a business out here which was quite famous and the same thing happened to us. In this particular business, one person over a four-year window was skimming off the payroll, $20 million, and that business went under. Literally 500 people lost their jobs. And so the same thing happened to us in a different space, but you know we had a fancy accountant and he was doing all this stuff. If you're not, what you don't measure, you can't manage. Rather, you can't manage what you don't measure. Yep. So the next thing is to measure everything. And the thing that I would always say to people is, if there's two professions that'll send you broke, it's lawyers and accountants. And if you've got to run off to those guys to get advice about everything before you make a decision as the entrepreneur, you'll never get off the ground and all you'll be doing is paying these guys bills. So I always say to people to measure it particularly the top five revenue variables, which is basically your lead generating, which is your marketing, your sales, which is your conversion, that's equal to your number of customers, times the impact experience, which is the, if you like, the dollar value per transaction. And this is one straight multiplication multiplied by the post-sale experience, and that's equal to your revenue. That's the top four. Then you look at your margin, multiply it by your margin. And of course, in cost in services is different. If you improve those five revenue variables, those five, by just 10%, and there hasn't been a business yet that we haven't worked with where we haven't been able to achieve that. That's an improvement on your GP of 61%. Just there. Just fixing those five things. And the next thing I would say would be communication skills. Mm. I'm working with a, a software firm at the moment. They turn over 20 mil. They keep five cents in the dollar. And I had the owner of the business say to me after the third session I did with them, which was on-site corporate training, he said, if we were implementing these type of communication strategies, we would double our bottom line. So if you're keeping five cents on a dollar and out of 20 million, you're keeping a million, that would be 2 million instead of 1 million. Hmm. And to fix those communication, it's probably the most underrated business strategy of all time is to have really clear, zero tolerance to errors, communication strategies in your business. Hmm. Because hardly even talk about it, half the businesses that go broke is because of mistakes, yeah. which were preventable through communication. Yeah. So that's just a snapshot. Of like, was that six or seven? I can't remember. <laughs> but there's, there's quite a few things in there which are very basic and they're all costless. Yeah. All those things are nothing. You've got to have a minimum based level of, like, for example, dealing with lawyers. What they're good at is creating work and not necessarily solving problems. Mm. So if you've got an outstanding debt, one of the subjects that we spend a bit of time on is called how to get paid and keep your customers happy. But if you run off to the lawyer every time that there's money owing to you and send a lawyer letter, A, it's going to cost a lot of money. And number two, it's going to alienate the customer. Mm. So have really tight credit policies in place. Yep. So that's an example. A few more around that. Which most don't have as well. I was um, contacted by, you reminded me of a lady I met who had the idea to go into helping entrepreneurs, especially small business owners with the whole law thing and trademarking and stuff because often they get into trouble. Like you said, in the beginning of the one business when there was just that one sentence which cost them their business. It doesn't cost anything to ask. Just asking where's the loophole and not assuming that things are just going to go easy. You know, it's not a That's problem. Right. I was going to say to you, and that is you talked about purpose and passion and doing... Yes what it is that you know that you put on this place for. And I can tell you after all these years, for me, it's stopping people from getting in the trough of sorrow and stopping people from going broke and making those mistakes for a small amount of time and a very small amount of money. Because they go out and they do these really expensive, if you look at an accelerator, A, it can be very expensive, but 90% of people that apply to go into an accelerator which will usually learn what they need to learn, they get rejected. Yeah. So we look at those people, both tech and non-tech, and it's usually non-tech that we focus on. But the thing that's exciting me is, and I know this is going to be the result, that people that learn this stuff in a very small amount of time, and I'm doing a lot of this stuff for free, by the way, a lot of networking and meetup groups. I do heaps in like about an average one a week. 
they won't end up in that situation in the first place. That's what's exciting for me, yeah. to make sure that they don't end up being a statistic like so many of these other guys, of which I was one myself. We need to cut it short, but you mentioned something over there, and it's so true, is that it was one of my questions I wanted to ask you about. Knowledge isn't power unless it's applied. And I went through life self-teaching myself so many things. I don't want to go with the what ifs, but you can save yourself time by investing money in yourself and time by learning things that can accelerate your progress, accelerate your growth, your personal growth, your business growth. And they're just simple things just by, you don't have to always self-teach yourself so many things. And just things like that, like I'm not a fan of preventing failure or preventing mistakes, like you have to go through them. But even if you're in them, knowing that you can get out of them quicker than what you would be if you didn't take on any advice or teaching or something to that effect. So I just want to share that as well. (laughs) So for all my guests, I ask two questions at the end of the interview. The first one being is filling in the blanks on three of my values. So what your take of them are. The first one being, so creativity for you is? Creativity for me is, wow, riding my motorbike every Sunday. (laughs) Oh, that's nice. I like that. It doesn't happen. (laughs) (laughs) That's the problem. That's why it's creative. Oh, that's so good. Passion for you is? Riding my motorbike every Sunday. Passion for me is definitely getting the results, helping people for a nickel and a dime, to become successful, be happy in business and not miserable and making more money than they would if they, so many people I met in business, they're they're just not making money, you know, and they're working really hard for nothing. And so when I can turn that around for people, nothing more excites me than that. Love that. Wisdom for you is? Well, if I took a note out of Jim Rohn, it would be, and I agree with you entirely about implementation and the practicality you know he said that formal education will make you a living but self-education will make you a fortune so i don't necessarily agree with that if it's only self-education because you only know what you know and you don't know what you don't know i thought i invented that phrase about 35 years ago but it turns out (laughs) other people have been using it as well everyone should read this book called the personal mba by a guy called josh kaufman i think i'm pronouncing that I've got that book. That is a great book. And he says in that, everyone will have you believe you've got to do an MBA. Mm. But the average break-even point for an MBA is 12 years. So my advice, wisdom-wise, is don't run off to university. Follow your dream and do what you love. Don't get sucked in to believing you've got to go and spend all these years at university to get the result that someone else may think that you should be looking for. I love that. And my last question, how do you want to change or challenge the world doing what you do? Well, I want to challenge people to develop the common sense of learning stuff before they go into business and take the risk of going under because that just destroys lives and makes for a miserable existence. I'm actually looking at something at the moment, which is a beacle and I'm talking to a company right now. I've I've started this thing in Nigeria called the Inner Circle. And I'm working with a number of people in some third world countries. I just did a speaking tour, in fact, in the Middle East. And my wife started this thing called, in Egypt, Education is Our Future, which is an NGO. And what I would like to ultimately do is become successful enough so that we can use our business as a means to go beyond what I said earlier about people just in business, but to help people around the world and take our knowledge to, on the international stage, a little bit like microloans. You know about microloans? Yep, I do. So I'm right behind that stuff. There's a, I think it's called Adara. Is it Adara or Adana? They're a worldwide organization actually based here in Sydney, not far from where I am right now. And They are a a very big beacle. So they're an advisory, consultancy, financial services firm, not-for-profit, and all the money they make from that goes straight back into building schools and so forth in third world countries. So ultimately, that's where I want to be. I'm not there yet, but I've got a few balls rolling in that direction. I love that. That's life purpose. It's got nothing to do with what you do. 
your talents and your gifts. It's a deeper lying. It's your life purpose. Why are you here to serve the others? Thank you so much, Rick, for being here with us today and sharing you. your wealth of knowledge. I could talk forever because this is like business. I love business, branding, marketing, strategy. It's all there. We'll have in the show notes links to all your social media, links to your website, to the book that you suggested as well for those that would like to receive the ebook. For those that are in Australia, you can let Rick know as well. He can send that with the post as well. So much information. Thank you very, very much. Well, we'll probably hear from you again soon. I really support things like the NGO with microloans because it helps us think out of the box that isn't yeah. taught in schools. So I love that. Thank you very much. Just one final offer to anyone that comes to you through this. If they want to go through my course, through your connection and they're here, I will put them through at no charge. Wow, that's okay? incredible. Thank you. My pleasure. That's huge. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Okay, guys, you got to take him on there because that's like huge. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Speak to you soon, guys, and we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. Dang, that was just super califragilisticexpialidocious. I enjoyed having you on board and please do me and you a favor. Head on over to iTunes, SoundCloud or Stitcher. Click subscribe and a super bonus. Leave your review and you stand a chance of being announced and advertised on the show. I'm always striving to ensure that your brand is uplifted and empowered. Remember, done is better than perfect. So be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and send in your feedback too. You're the absolute best. Keep rocking.